Hello and welcome to the Champagne and Kiviet blog. I'm Allison and thanks for being here. On today's episode, I'm really excited to be knitting and chatting with a very good friend of mine, knitting guru Kate Atherley. I call Kate the knitting guru because um, I really believe that she's taught me everything I know about being a terrific knitter. There's, um, I think, somebody in all of our lives as knitters who has really helped push us to become a better craftsperson, and Kate has definitely been that person for me. I have taken a number of her classes, almost everything that uh, she teaches in her repertoire and she's a really great person to learn from if you ever get the opportunity. Kate is also the author of a number of books and her latest book is what I want to chat with her about today. It's a Knitter's Dictionary, Knitting Know-How from A to Z. I've got a lot of questions about this book, so let's uh, jump in and have our little uh, stitch and bitch with Kate. Oh look, we're yellow twinsies today. Mm, yes, excellent. Well, I have to wear a color. I'm periodically reminded you really should wear it. Oh look, I'm wearing a color. Yes, but you, I noticed that you like plunked that on right when you sat down. Yeah, yeah. you had to, you had to conduct. You were in full black. Yeah, as per usual. Well, well, white. I mean, I've got a white t-shirt on, but you know, white is not a color. For me, it, it's pushing the boat out. So yes, as <laughs> as a color or not. So yeah, but I know enough not to appear on camera wearing, you know. Okay, fine then. Well, listen, um, I wanted to talk to you today about this book because it's so beautiful. <laughs> I think it's kind of great. Too. But did you see the best part? I think I know what that is. Yeah. But for the benefit of everybody at home. It's a flip book. Like, this was a complete surprise to me as well. We're not going to be able to catch this on camera. No, but I if can do you do the flip book thing, like the little ball of yarn moves across the bottom of the pages. It's very like, adorable. It's, worth, it's almost worth writing a book just to like have that. And it was a surprise, which was the best part. So. Nice. And it's working with a big publisher, the graphic designer, it's a much more hands-off relationship. And so stuff comes back and sometimes you're like, okay. But this, I'm so pleased with it. I'm so you should be pleased, pleased with, it. with the design. Well, I was I was flipping through it again this morning um, before you came over, and I was noticing, you know, the fact that it's got illustrations and not photographs, and it just, in spite of that, has a real modern feel to it. Mm. Like the graphic design is really beautiful. It's got um, a high tactile quality mm. just because it's like the right size and the right weight. And so I pulled off. <laughs> Yeah, my shelf. Okay, my my, my knitting bookshelf. Yeah. Um, the knitting, the penguin knitting book. Love this one. I love both of these. Actually. Mary Thomas's book of knitting patterns. Yeah. Which of course is mostly illustrations, but yeah. they have, you know, different pictures and things in them as well. But yeah. I don't. I, I feel like they they don't quite hit the mark in terms of what your book is achieving, right? Like there's a lot of patterns, and they're mm -hmm. sort of like, well, this is how you knit. And this is how you purl. Yeah. And this is how you just do a cast off. Yeah. And that's fine. I mean, there's whole books on, you know, yeah. casting on and, and casting off. But this one, you really get into the language of knitting. So maybe that's well, it's where a, we should start. All this, this came from, so I wrote the pattern writing book because I, so my secret identity is as a tech editor. Right. The thing I do when I'm at home um, but the other thing I do, in addition to design and teach and write books, is I work as a tech editor. So I review other people's patterns, and I look at what other people have written, and I help them, you know, sort of check the mathematics. But this is where my educational background and my professional background comes into play as well, because it also, for me, I like to say to designers that I actually think the words are more important than numbers. You can often recover if in a pattern there's a number mistake, but you're going to have a less easy time recovering where there's a mistake in the words. 
For example, I sent out a pattern for some test knitting and I had goofed in the description of the tubular bind off. I missed a key phrase, which is with the needle behind, essentially, it was to do with where you put the, anyway. Um, and what resulted was something that was not at all the tubular bind off and not at all <laughs> what was intended. But I've also, but that's, you know, sort of testing, but tech editing as well, that reviews that kind of stuff. But also, I mean, I sent out a hat pan once where I actually had written over enthusiastically that you were to cast on 900 stitches rather than 90. Right. But a knitter can more easily recover from that one than they can from the mistaken tubular bind off instructions because 900, you look at that and think, whoa, 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 whoa. I think there's something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Right? They definitely made a mistake here. Right. Yeah. Or at least, mm, that doesn't feel right. Let me check. Whereas if you've not done a tubular cast off before, if you're not familiar with it, you're going to get into serious trouble because you will take my instructions at their word, of course, because, you know. Because they're printed. Right. Um, and so usability to me becomes crucial. And usability in the way that the instructions are written. This is a very long answer, by the way. No, it's all me. good. Um, how the instructions are written. So I wrote this book about how to write the instructions. And I have been joking for years that I wanted to write the companion volume, which was how to read the instructions. But nobody. But you teach that. I do teach that. Yeah. But nobody's going to buy a book how to read knitting patterns because that feels like homework but also if you've got five pounds you're going to spend it on a pattern you're not going to spend it on a book about how to like really why would you do that be like trying to sell a, a book on how to read recipes like people don't think they need it mm -hmm. whereas this is my sneaky pattern reading book because what this is this allows you to really solve the problem when you need it because that's the other thing you you don't want to read a hundred pages in advance because you won't retain the stuff you need. Whereas this becomes, what does it mean when it says work even in pattern? What does it say when it means work ah, even in pattern? Yeah, mm. so that's what you look up here. So when you're sort of reading a pattern and there's the crisis, I think it's under E for even, actually. Oh, okay, because that's um, under... Uh, yeah, no, I know. Under that is work even. even. <laughs> I'll put the emphasis on even there. But that's what you look, that's, like, that's when you need it, when you're in the middle of a pattern. You're not going to read it in advance because, again, why would you? That doesn't make sense in terms of how you use it. But this becomes where you look when it gives you a specific instruction. at the same time. Oh, look at that. It's like half a page. A leak, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So reversing the shapings. Half at, at the same time. At the same time and reversing shapings and those sorts of things. So it's a, just a general reference book on all of that stuff and designed to be, use it when you need it, in the moment. And so it's small. It fits in your project bag, in your knitting bag, ideally. Yes. It's the kind of thing that Absolutely. I hope that yarn shops keep on the shelf so that it's a reference for people for, at knit nights it's, as well. It's fantastic. I mean, and it's sort of... I've really been enjoying just sort of flipping through and every so often just picking something up and go, oh, I know how to do that, or I don't know how to do that. Good. So Excellent. it's been it's been good for that. But, yeah. I mean, I guess you've sort of talked about how it came about. Yeah. And you just sort of were like, okay, yeah, I'm going to... But, like, where do you... Where do you start? <laughs> where you're like, yeah. I'm going to write an inner dictionary. Yeah. Right? So, like, I you just... Talk to my editor about it and when we landed on that it should be a dictionary I was like and then you take a deep breath and think I have no idea how to write a dictionary I have never done one of these before so well, what it's I it's part dictionary part encyclopedia almost. yeah kind of yeah, yeah. yeah it's a yeah a dic anyway so yeah encyclopedia I have no idea um what I did was I went through the index I have a shelf well, yeah, even similar. Yeah, yeah, we have shelves. Yours are slightly tidier than mine. Um, it's, it's for your benefit oh, because you're here. Thank you. <laughs> wow. wow. All the mess is out of frame. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you just <laughs> shove it onto the ground. Um, but so what I did is I went to my shelves and I went through all my knitting books and basically looked at what was in the index of my knitting books and looked at the terms, looked at all of the things that people would look up, right? Because why do you put something in an index? You put it in an index because you might need to look it up. Right. So I'm going to look through the, the indexes of all of my knitting books and all of my favorite knitting reference books. Then because I'm me, I created a spreadsheet. Of course you did. Of course I did. Well done. Um, and 
then I created five times the content that it turned out I needed. So hint, if you're thinking of writing a book, when you sign the contract, make a note of the word count you're committing to. Okay. Because it turns out that when, you know, I wrote five times as much, and if I'd actually paid attention to the word count I was committing to, I could have saved myself some time. Sure. Well, um, it's funny, actually. In hindsight, at first I was... Uh, quite upset with myself when I realized I had written five times too much but it turns out that I needed to have overwritten so that I could prune back right well and in this day and age you know in terms of content generation well, right. it's never going to be a terrible thing to have more content than you need right? exactly because exactly. that will be used somewhere else oh, presumably. Absolutely. and it was important as well for the process of researching mm -hmm. because I needed to there were things I needed to research in more detail in terms of how to explain them or, you know, I ended up having this amazing conversation with a very good friend who is a trained machine knitter and I didn't understand what jacquard knitting was and how it related to different work, different ways of working with multiple colors and how jacquard was machine knitting and related to hand knitting and all of that. So I learned tons and tons and it, you know, admit the entry for jacquard knitting is long gone. I think that was the very first one to go. Okay. Um, she's still got to thank you in the book though because she was very patient with me, Carrie. But I, it inf helped inform sort of how I wrote about other stuff. Uh, and crochet, you know, I wrote a fair bit about crochet and that wasn't able to, we weren't able to retain it in the book. But that's obviously helpful for me in terms of other things that I do. And who knows, maybe there'll be another. I do the crocheter's dictionary. Yeah, maybe, yeah, possibly, yeah. I think, you know, once upon a time I actually thought about writing, writing the crochet pattern writing book as well. And then so maybe there's a crochet pattern writing book and maybe there's a crochet dictionary. We'll see. I don't know. We'll How see. much do you crochet? This is a total aside. By yeah, the way. you know what? I, I know you as a knitter, not as a yeah. crochet. I mean, I know you know how to crochet. Yes, crochet is a palate cleanser for me because I'm not that sophisticated at it, and um, I just basically crochet granny squares, and I've got a giant sock yarn, leftover sock yarn granny square blanket that sits on my lap on my desk in Toronto because cold, uh, and it's sort of lap sized. And periodically, I will just sort of go on a on a crochet kind of rampage binge. binge, and I will just add in a load of sock yarn leftovers, and it is one giant granny square. So I just go round and round and oh. round. Like, so like you're not joining oh, squares no. or anything. Oh no! It's just I'm just joining okay. and going round. So now you know you you I don't even get necessarily depending on the leftovers all the way around okay. because it's quite big, but it's great. It's multicolored and ridiculous. This was inspired by a crochet bl blanket my grandmother made where she was more sensible about it because she was doing strips and then sort of crocheting around the strips. And she still didn't piece it together, right. but she did different shape sections. Cool. Uh, but so, so I'm not very good at turning the corner and like I can turn a corner, but I'm not very good at keeping the edges straight if you're just doing a rectangle, do you crochet? I have made squares and then put them together. Okay. Because the problem for me with crochet is I'm not very attentive about keeping the edges straight if you're crocheting a rectangle. Because you've got to make sure that you cro like make the right height turning chain and crochet into the oh, right. Oh, yes. I see so, what you mean. So okay. that was where, so my initial plan, I got, f I'm, this blanket's been on the go since my very first book, actually, because the first scraps in the middle or leftovers from my first book projects in 2012 so I mean I've got better at crochet since but when I first started I wasn't keeping the edges straight so I said oh stuff it. I'm just going to go around and around and around but I kind of like it yeah um and it's sock yarn of course it took to take the rest of my life uh but the other thing I have is that as a knit designer it is amusing to me that probably my most worn shawl is a crochet shawl. Hmm. It's I did so it's a half granny square. I'm really pushing the boat out. A half granny square. Um, it's a half granny triangle. Um, uh, Jennifer, actually, the poll got me started on this. Thank you, Jennifer. Yay! Yay, Yay for Jennifer. Yeah, shout out. She, yes, shout out to Jennifer because she actually showed me how to like make it a triangle rather than a square. Um, and it's in Noro. It's in. It's in the um, Dearly Departed Korean Sock Yarn. Terrible sock yarn, by the way, but a really great yarn for things like crochet. 
and it's just a great great triangle and it's in my favorite color 242 doesn't everybody know just the color of the blue is there kind of black well it's well yeah black <laughs> um, okay you'll be surprised here it's black and there's gray and there's orange uh, there oh. is also red and there's a little bit of green in it Okay, I think but I, know, I think I know, right? The color you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it's all the colors I wear at the same time. Don't be absurd. But it's the colors I wear and the color colors I really like, and so it goes with everything. Perfect. Because I can put it on; it matches anything. So I have in this color, I have the shawl, I have a hat, I have a cardigan, and I have a lane splitter skirt. I have put them all beautiful. put them all on at the same time precisely once for purely for comedic effect, because uh, otherwise you know it's your Ryan Beck outfit right where everything is hand knit and everything matches. So yeah, one day I will go to Ryan Beck wearing full Noro outfit. My Ryan Beck skirt was the land splitter. Yeah, that one and only time I've been to yeah. Ryan Beck. Yeah, and I was knitting and casting off and inserting the elastic waistband the morning well, that yeah. we went to the fairgrounds. Because of course, that's the way I roll. Yeah, of course. So, um, um, we're you know we're, we all doing stuff like that. But yeah, so uh, crochet. So I love this shawl, this half granny triangle in my beloved Noro two four two, and I wear it so much. And then you get these conversations. Oh, so you're a knitter? Hey, and then did you make that? Well, yeah, but it's not knitted. Um, so oh well, never mind. Well, I mean, if we're talking about the language of knitting, in many other cultures, knitting and crochet, they aren't differentiated. It's yeah. just, you say knitting and it means both. Yeah, or you exactly. say crochet and it means... Yeah, I mean, they're yarn both. crafts. And I mean, yeah. there's so much connection between the two. I mean, even picking up stitches in knitting is a crochet maneuver. So, yeah, we shouldn't separate them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny. It just it makes me chuckle. But yeah, so I do crochet, but because I can only basically do two things... It becomes a palate cleanser because I don't. I'm not trying to do anything else. I'm sure I could, uh, okay. and I've played with a little bit of amigurumi and stuff. But I just keep it to that, and so I don't have to think. And I find it strangely. I find crochet very rhythmic and musical. Like I musical, was, musical. Like I will, because I'm always listening to music. Because I'm always, you know, crafting on public transport. I was on the way here, and I've got music on, and I found myself. I was crocheting along with the music. Nice. Which was sort of cool. Well, I mean, in this room, we can think that that's cool. I'm sure other we can think work, but that that's cool. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. Well, I actually have a question for you related to that, okay. but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold okay. off on that because right. I have a little surprise for you. Uh oh. Okay. Afterwards. Oh no. Um. So you talked about having five times more content than than needed for the book. How do you decide what stays and what goes was it, other than just it was well like, it's not going to be machine knitting or it's not going to be right crochet. yeah like, well so we went through and it was some tough conversations with my editor because and we had we eliminated kind of big categories at first like okay anything machine knitting we take out crochet we boiled it down spinning we boiled it down and then it was just a case of okay and we had a long hard conversation for example about like how deep do I do I go with something like brioche Right, because there are whole books on that. Right, right. And so this is where my education, I think, shows in a funny way. So I studied theoretical mathematics, pure mathematics. And the thing about pure mathematics is that it's not about numbers or calculations. You spend a lot of time thinking about how, oh, I don't know, the number system is structured and how number theory and how calculus works and really I've recovered um, but I love this sort of stuff and it's about the structure and it's how things work and you spend a lot of time doing proofs which is really just a case of trying to understand something in a really general way and understand how pieces interact and so part of the deal with this mathematics is that you're not solving number problems it's not you know if two trains are going in opposite directions and, oh, don't. you know, but the, right, yeah, exactly. you're, you're a mom, you know, you've got, you've got I'm a little homework. scared. Yeah, exactly. But you know the word problems in maths classes yeah. where it's like, you know, 
the two trains are going towards the same station and one of them is traveling at, you know, such and speed and one is traveling and, you know, it's, it has so much fuel and they have to get there by whatever. And it's, it's none of that. It's about how do numbers interact and how does, how do the number systems work and how do solids fit together on different types of planes and you, your eyes are glazing over. But the, <laughs> the deal with mathematics at that level is it's not about necessarily knowing how to solve the problems. It's about fitting concepts together and the key to fitting concepts together is you've got to know a whole load of stuff but you can't remember all because it's all very complicated so it's about knowing where to get the information you don't have or understanding the definitions and I would do group work with my friends at university and we'd be working on these essentially research problems where we had to sort of get down to a theoretical level and do a proof, you know, right. prove that this solid does this under these conditions in topology, you know, and I'd be like, okay, uh, well, we know these facts about these solids, I understand this, these facts about this, I understand these facts about this, so let's put all the information we know together and see how what comes out of understanding the definitions. And so the joke was with my friends that if nothing else, if I wasn't very good at anything else, I always knew the definition. Okay. So here I am. It makes me laugh. I'm like, yeah, I know the definitions. It's good. It's good. Um, so because it's, we can extrapolate, right? So when you're thinking about something like brioche, see, I can always bring it back to knitting. I haven't given you the gauge lecture yet, but I will. When you're thinking about something with, about brioche, I said what's most important is that people see the basic definition, people understand the big picture. I cannot, in this book, teach you about how brioche and fisherman's rib are related and whether the fabrics are the same. But what I can talk about is they are, I can give you the base definition. So brioche does this, fisherman's rib does this. Um, it creates a fabric that looks like this. If you want to know more, here's the here's the reason. So that's sort of, it's funny, it's kind of a synthesis and it's a provide the base definitions and then point us to where you need to know more. So I laughed sometimes when we were putting this together and when we were working on that that terrible editing process, the pruning process, and it came back to, it's like, okay, what's the base piece of information I would want someone to know that will provide them enough that they could understand a book that goes deeper? And that's what that's about. Oh. I can't answer every question in there. There's no way. No. But can I equip you with just enough so that you can read a book that goes deeper? Okay, that's fair. Good Lord, that makes me sound pompous. But anyway, hopefully I've achieved something yeah. in that direction. Right? Did you um? Did you have a favorite word or technique that was in there? I had to fight really to. I just sort of had a fight about yarn bath, and I'm so glad I was able to keep it. <laughs> yarn bath is in here. You know, of course, it's in there. Really? Yeah. Hang on. Because yarn barf, a term coined to describe the tangle of yarn that sometimes emerges when you pull out the end of a center pole ball. You know this, right? I'm not even going to do it because it's going to barf all over your sofa. So, yeah. <laughs> but yarn Every barf, time I do it, last time I did that in a workshop and somebody said, Alison, you've just disemboweled that ball of yarn. <laughs> so yarn barf is what happens if I let that loose, right? And it's, um, yeah, so that's in the book too. Because part of the lingo, like this is part of the lingo of knitting. But is that, is yarn barf, okay, so we're going to talk about yarn barf. Okay. Is that just referring to the heinous mess that comes out of the middle of a central pole ball? Yeah. Only ever? Like it's not just yeah. a tangle? could well, it just be a tangle? I think, I'm going to have to pull this, it's when you pull it out and it goes, you know, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows what you mean. Don't, don't, right? I, I don't, don't expect, to, to, dis to, I don't expect like, you to disembowel your, yeah. your ball of yarn. Yeah, okay. no, thank you. But it, disemboweling is also an excellent framing for it and phrasing for it. Well, because yeah. people understand that, right? It's like yeah. you've just taken the guts out of the yeah, middle. Yeah, yeah. But it, like, it does feel quite medical, actually, when you're poking around in there. It's like those games they make you play when you're kids with the spaghetti and the... Well, and... I've been in workshops where I got a little naughty because, you know, you're trying to find the middle of the center pole ball, you know, ball and people are like, you're fingering that yarn and 
you know, ball of yarn and it's just and it goes. It just yeah. goes downhill yeah, from exactly. there, right? I didn't realize we were working blue in this podcast. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, apparently we are in this one. Yes, but, it's know. true. We'll, but, we'll put a we'll put a uh, disclaimer up at the yeah. beginning. Yeah. So okay. yarn box. So but, that was but your that's thing. part of the lingo too, yeah. right? Because what you've got there are really and the yarn harlot reminds us of this on a regular basis. Stephanie Pearl McPhee, because um, I know her. I, I you know, I, she's amazing. Yeah, she is amazing. She's very funny. She's very perceptive and very smart. And she continues to remind us on a regular basis, and she's 100% correct, that there are more knitters off Ravelry than on Ravelry, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so we use all this language, this digital language, and it's, it's Ravelry is not, I'm not, you know, this is not a bad thing about Ravelry. Oh, no, I don't think, there, I don't but there's think like the online like knitters and there's the offline knitters. And the online knitters, we're all, we all use this, the, you know, we talk about LYSs and we talk about UFOs and we talk about whips and we talk about, um, sure, yarn that's our short, our shorthand for, you know, if you're typing something really quickly and you're sending a text or you're on, you're on the gram, you know, Instagram or, or IG. I mean, I like, I shorted yeah, it to IG. Right, like, yeah. And so it's, just it's a time saver, but you nobody necessarily talks like that right. in so, person. But yeah. we've got so, these terms, and there's a lot of knitters out there who don't know what they mean. And what you get is a knit night. I've seen it at a knit night where you see a collision of, you know, e knitters and normal knit, <laughs> you know, and analog knitters, digital knitters. But you know, people who don't necessarily participate in the online forums in the communities, they have no idea what LYS right. is. And because their community probably is at an LYS, yes. right? They yeah. have their own knit and natter or yeah. stitch and bitch or knit night yeah. or whatever it is that they they go to yeah. and participate in. Yeah. So yeah, so so that was important to me that all of those terms and that sort of modern lingo <laughs> um, got included to make that bridge between yeah. you know the 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 digital knitters and the yeah, they're not. Well, I think that's that's another reason why it's so good is that, you know, for anybody who is offline, I mean, they don't necessarily have... I, I think I'm very privileged because my LYS, my local yarn store, was the Purple Pearl, which is where we met in Toronto. And, you know, there are really great knitters there, oh, yeah. right? As Who are part of the knitting circle oh, and yeah. the knit night, yourself included, Carrie, who you mentioned before. And when I first started going there... I didn't know what I didn't know. And so yeah. I always asked a lot of questions yeah. and there was a wealth of knowledge in yeah. that group. And, you know, if ever I was getting too annoying, it would be like, Alison, here's a class for that. Or, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. But I think that was very lucky and not necessarily every knit group or knitting mm -hmm. circle will necessarily have the same knowledge. So to be able to have it all in one place is good. Or, Somebody might be sitting next to you at knit night mm. and can show you something, but maybe they don't have the words yeah. to explain it properly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah. so while we might learn something offline, you know, yeah. it isn't always necessarily the same as somebody who's taken the care to put yeah. the word you know, yeah. the words together. And the offline online thing is interesting too, because as a knitting teacher and I mean, you you know, you're sort of like, you're an industry professional, whether you've worked in, actually on the ground in a yarn store or not, you've worked at enough events and things that you've, like, inevitably, you've worked in a yarn store, you're a knitting teacher, you encounter knitters who have, well, I looked it up on, on the YouTube, mm -hmm. and I've, I have a terrible poker face, I am not good at it, it, it being polite about stuff like that. There's some good stuff on YouTube. There's some amazing stuff on YouTube. The problem with YouTube is that, so the joke I use in my class is anybody and their dog can put a knitting video up on YouTube and my right. dog is really bad at the long tail cast on. So, <laughs> but you just, it's, and no one is putting up knitting videos on YouTube with an intent to deceive. This is not a criticism of the people we're putting. The, everybody is, because that's what's so wonderful about the knitting community. Everybody just wants to help. Everybody wants to share their knowledge. I love yep. that about Everybody this. wants to share their secrets. Right, yeah. and I love it. But it's really hard to do a good knitting video. I've been learning this. But it's hard to make sure all the details are right and easily seen. And it's about the speed at which you knit. It's about 
the angle of the camera, right? Like you can't, I mean, you're too far away, but if you're shooting like that, you can't see my stitches. You can't see exactly what I'm doing with the yarn. Like it has to be over top. And then you've got to have the right color of yarn against the needles. Like this yellow wouldn't work. It works, it would work brilliantly against, you've got the, the dark wood needles, but against the metal needles, there's not enough contrast. Also, this is far too fine. So, so the, the videos are tough because you know, you can't necessarily see, it's not necessarily wildly clear, and you also frankly don't have someone sitting beside you saying, oh, no, actually what she's doing with the yarn is this. Oh, it should go the other way around the needle, or actually you're gonna be less likely to give yourself a wrist hurt if you hold the needles this way. It's all of that stuff that you don't pick up from watching, from just watching a video. And it's not that you have to pay, a, pay for class necessarily, but it's the stuff that you pick up at stitch night when someone says, oh, you know, it would be better if, or, oh, have you tried this? Or, hey, did you know? You know, or your grand would have taught you, or what have you. So that gets lost with videos. And, yeah. you know, everybody who's worked in a yarn store ha or worked, taught classes has had the situation where you've got someone who has picked something wrong up. And again, not because the video is wrong necessarily, um, but because they don't know or they didn't have somebody to guide them. And so, you know, if you're in a class with me and I say to you, I, I come over and I say sort of gently, so how, how long have you been knitting? <laughs> That's my introduction to the, okay, something you're doing isn't necessarily helping, isn't necessarily conventional. And this is an interesting discussion, right? Because if you wrap your purl stitches the other way is that wrong right because you never want to say that somebody's no. doing something wrong no I mean, especially if they've been doing it for 20 years exactly right? and so you know one hopes the answer to the question is i've been knitting a week i'm like okay all right good we'll just get you going in the conventional north american manner or the conventional western manner it depends on which where I am currently. Um, but if somebody's been knitting that way and wrapping a pull the other way for 20 years, then we get to have a, com a conversation about combination knitting, which is a really cool conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are lots of things in knitting where it's not wrong, it's just different and there are adaptations. Once in a while you encounter something where somebody's doing something, it's like, oh no, that's, that is genuinely not correct yes. for whatever reason. But most of the time it, you know, it kicks off a great discussion about something, but it's, it's challenging. And I, I mean, the way that I sold the book to the publisher, the way that I convinced the publisher that really I wanted to do it in this way and there should be some sort of guide to pattern reading was I said, okay, Imagine that you've never read a knitting pattern before and you encounter the phrase work even. Try and Google the word even in a knitting context, right? There are things that you could Google that if you Google S2KPO, you're going to get a knitting answer, right? Right. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the first, you know, 95% of the hits are going to be, if you Google S2KPO, you're gonna, they're knitting related. I'm sure it's probably, there's another industry that uses the abbreviation for something, but I haven't encountered it yet. But even, that's a word that gets used a fair bit, right? So yeah, so how do you, or even at the same time, right? So not everything is available, not everything can be answered with a quick Google, like you need the knitting context for it. And Absolutely. so that's what that book's about. Love it. Did you um, did you come across anything in the book that that went in that you were really surprised by or delighted by? Like anything that you maybe learned that was completely unexpected? I don't know that I did. Just know it all. Well, yeah, no, I'm like saying that. I'm hesitating because it's like that does make me sound like I know it all. I think. Because I've been deep into the language of knitting for a long time, and the language of knitting patterns for a long time, um, that I don't think there was anything that was a that was a huge surprise to me. Oh, I'm thinking now. There was one thing that came up recently. Now, of course, I'm not going to remember it, but it was a Twitter conversation that came up, and it was related to something I'd written about in the book, and it was it surprised me that. 
people that it was sort of one of those where more people didn't take it utterly for granted and completely understand it. This is going to bug me now. I'm going to have to think about it. But there were a few things where... You can tell me and I'll put a card up. After yeah, exactly. Yeah. But even the discussion about what it's what it means when it says... The whole discussion around what it means when it says repeat the last two rows. Because there's a whole discussion around how do you phrase that. Repeat the last two rows so many times and is it work the last two rows or is it repeat the last two rows so many times more so I have a, a formulation that I like that one of my favorite words to use when I'm tech editing is disambiguate because I'm pompous okay <laughs> but I like to you know for me I like to make sure things are completely clear and if you say repeat the last two rows ten times to me that's ambiguous I have I have been on the receiving end of your technical editing. Yeah. And I remember saying to Rachel, our other tech yeah. editing friend, I said, I kind of I kind of wonder if Kate is like this with all her clients or if it's just because we knew each other. Because you were like your email was so succinct and you were like, and this? No. And this? Wah, ha, ha, ha. And this is right. <laughs> You were not completely yeah. disparaging, but I was like, whew. I'm like, okay, Kate really got to the nitty gritty. And I'm like, darn, I need to, you know, up my game and, and work harder here. And I was like, oh, it's Kate's looking at it. I'm like, yeah. okay. I am yeah. the meanest. <laughs> and most, I am one of the meanest and one of the most demanding in the, in the industry. It's true. Well, but also. But I think there was something in there where you were like, no, this is not clear. Or, yeah. Well, for me. I overcomplicate stuff, too. It, well, yeah. And I mean, there's. It's when you're for writing your first patterns. I look at my first patterns, and trust me, I think yours was a lot better than some of my first patterns. But that's because I read your book. <laughs> um, but it's that it's hard to write a missing pattern because you come at it from the perspective of the way you read and understand stuff, right? So one of the things that you have to do, and I see the role of the tech editor as being okay. But let's just add in the perspective of different knitters. And let's add in the perspective of people who learn a different way from you. And let's add in the perspective of people who, who's, you know, um, learn to knit in a different language. And even different language. I mean, we're dealing with transatlantic language here, too. And so Completely. the role of the tech editors, like, if a pattern comes back to me, if I send something off to be tech edited and it comes off with no comes back with no comments at all, I feel like the, it, the tech editor hasn't done the job mm. because I want the extra like numbers issues aside, right? Like you yeah, forever, I'm yeah, you no, know, forget the numbers. Yeah, because if if you write a pattern one way and it's it's like okay, well I under of course it's a great pattern because yeah. I understand it, right? Yes, but not everybody. Exactly. Knits the way you do, or exactly. reads patterns the way you do. Or exactly. Whatever, right? so, so I want that, like, personally, I want that level of feedback because that tech editor is going to bring my perspective to it. Um, and so the one thing that I'm always doing for me is I'm, uh, I, I'm always get entering into lively discussions with my tech editor about what I need to put in the glossary. Because my position is that if you're at the level of knitting a sock, I don't need you to say K equals knit. I don't need to define K equals knit and P equals purl in the glossary. Okay. I also don't think that I need to define K to tog in the glossary either. But I will define SSK in the glossary. And so there's an interesting back and forth with my tech editor about like what what can we take for granted? What can we, what's safe to assume and what's not? And I always appreciate my tech editor's perspective. And um, things like, I think I remember what the discussion was, that if I say repeat the last, for example, if I say repeat rows one and two until the piece measures blah, 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 uh -huh. I'm going to assume that I want you to finish with row two. Right. Although I have seen patterns that says repeat these two rows. Yeah until measures X finishing on yes row absolutely two. yeah and I think and exactly and that's where my tech editor would say to me um, add that for clarity right like disambiguate so um, you know I'm sort of on my the high horse of precision because this is the mathematical background right like, this is the technical writing background and my technical editor quite rightly says you know what but just make sure that's understood just underline that point 
right. Um, and so I think that that's a really, really, you know, good thing for me to be called on. And so if somebody gets comments back from me, it's, it's you know, usually not because you did a terrible job because you didn't do a terrible job. No, it was, but it's about this other perspective and think about... Your job is to help somebody be better. Yeah. And yeah. think about the perspective of somebody who hasn't done this before, right? Because there's a difference between writing a pattern, writing a sock pattern for somebody who's knitted socks before and writing a beginner-friendly sock pattern. So, yeah, no, that, that aspect is really interesting to me, the usability aspect of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think about that a lot. But, yeah, the, the, the classic discussion for me is that when I see a pattern that says, repeat rows one and two ten times, like, that will never get past me if I'm editing because that's inherently ambiguous. Because, because of the gauge? No. If it just says repeat rows one and two ten times, like, is that in addition to the initial two? Oh, ten more times. Right? I see what you mean. Okay. okay. Because, and it's to do with what we're doing is we're taking casual, everyday spoken language. In gym class, it doesn't matter if when, let's do ten repeats, right? It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, you're, you know. Glutes hurt more. I'm always going to cheat on repeats. Right, exactly. <laughs> right? It's okay, Jim. You know, when you're, when you're working out. But it's, in knitting, it's absolutely crucial that you do it exactly the right number of times. So I say you've got to disambiguate. Make it precise. Because you could argue in either direction, repeat rows one and two ten times. I would, my understanding of that is I would say that's in addition to the initial row one do this row two do this repeat rows one and two ten times but i've heard i would say that's probably in addition to but right. i would have especially if when you're when it's all laid out in right patterns, right you've got row one row two and then the next line of instruction yeah. well and you've hit the nail on the head there because the layout becomes crucial in that too and the flow of the information so i say let's just add a word more times or right. some people, or I, you know, I will say work so many times. Well, and a lot of people will say, you know, please make sure you read through the whole pattern all yes. the way first, just yes. to make sure you notice things like at the same, the dreaded at, at the, the same, same time, time or yeah. whatever. But yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm very guilty of this. I don't read the pattern all but, the way through. Okay. Either. I do not read the pattern all the way through either because there are things that you simply cannot understand until the knitting's in your hand. Right? Yes, that's and true. And so there's a lot that, yeah, read the pattern all the way through, but there's a lot you're just not going to be able to absorb or understand in advance. Um, what I like to do is I will tell them to scan through just to look for key phrases like at the same time or reversing shapings because it just means that you have to start taking notes, basically. So you remember what you did. Well, if I'm doing a sizing, something that's sized, I might go through and, like, highlight all of my Absolutely. sizes at the beginning. Exactly. And then I notice little things like, Oh, how are they doing the shoulders yeah. or whatever? But then the when neckline. you encounter instructions yeah. that will say, you know, take the two pieces and lie them this way and, you know, holding this one on the left, do this and pick them up from the needle and blah, blah, blah. Like you're going to just, you're not going to absorb that when you're reading through it in advance. So just to, so until the pieces are in your hands. Um, and so I think to tell knitters to read through it in advance with the expectation that somehow everything will become miraculously clear is unfair. Yeah. Not because of the knitter, but because sometimes they don't have the knitting in front of it, uh, in front of them. And so they can't think about how these pieces go together. So I will, yeah, I, I don't, I don't read ahead. Um, like a recipe, I figure it should be set up so that if there's something I need to do in advance, I genuinely need to do or need to be aware of in advance, at least give me a hint. Right. Yeah. So I will say, sometimes I'll say, read the, this particular section, you know, dividing for the sleeves. Read this section in advance because, you know, neck shaping and armhole shaping take place at the same time or something like that. Because then I'm being precise about the demand. But if I say, here's a four-page pattern read through before you start you're not going to retain what you need to know i'm not going i'm not expecting me to retain yeah. all of that information through those four pages I, the the designer should be helping the knitter by saying this is the bit that you need to focus on also 
what happens is um, the designer can will hide behind. Well, you should have known to do that because I told you to read through in advance. It's like you should have known to pack, ah. you should have known to pack a cable needle because of well, there's cables in it, and you should have read through in advance. It's like no, no, there's a materials list for that. Put a cable needle in it. Yeah, you know, just yeah. play fair. So, but yeah, I'm a tough, tough tacker. You are, but that's good because you make everybody better. Hopefully, yes. Right. I'm going to suggest we take a break. Okay. And then we'll come back, and I've got a little surprise for you. Oh. So, cheers. It's good cheers. to see you. It's good to I'm, see you, too. I'm not giving you too big a glass, because I know Thank you're you. teaching I am. this Thank evening you. at yes. Tribe. So. Yes. Mm. But I thought for something fun I'm, and different... Uh, okay, go on. For me, ...that I would mind. do something I'm going to call the Prosecco Power Round. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got ten, ten questions or okay. prompts here. Okay. And... Uh, We'll just okay. you got to answer that fairly as fairly quickly as you can. All right. Or okay. um, or ask for for clarification. Okay. Okay. So first one, knitting or crocheting? Oh, well, knitting. I mean, okay. No disrespect to crochet. Oh no, but yeah. I'm actually competent at one of them. Right. So yeah. Okay. Yes. Favorite designer? Really putting you on the spot here. Yeah, you are. You know what? I'm going to say Anne Bud because it was Anne Bud who really led me down sort of the path about thinking about things in terms of general patterns, like plain patterns, multiple sizes, multiple gauges, stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. So Good yeah. answer. Solid answer. Yeah. I should say, you know, you could go pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, Fair enough. Fair enough. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so the thing about Anne's work, right, is I, like, I'm not talking about her design aesthetic. It's about the way she presents the the patterns and the design. So yeah. So it's a dodge, right? But yeah. No, okay. She's great. She's amazing. Very smart woman. Nice. Is that okay. your I didn't I didn't put a question in here about Nicharati, but is there anybody you've gone like totally gaga like <laughs> when you oh, met them? Oh, Nancy Bush. Okay. For like folks uh, as in folk socks, because she her folk socks is one of the first sock knitting books that I I bought a knit from and so she was just a name on a book for a long time and then I like I'm having a beer with Nancy Bush and it was you know and it was really amazing yeah nice very cool okay uh zombie apocalypse yarn regia sock yarn really oh yeah hmm. no question it'll last forever right it will outlast me it will it comes in amazing colors it yeah are they both uh that one is not but yeah, red jets up here, no question. Okay. Knitting pet peeve. Oh, <laughs> yes, this one's easy. I have so many. You, you, you have to pick just one. Um, you can't say people who learned how to knit from YouTube because we already covered no, that. No, no, no. You know what it is? It's, it's knitting patterns that do a rubbish job of explaining SSK. Oh, okay. That's very top of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't have yeah. to think about that one. No, no. Right. Is machine knitting cheating? No, absolutely not. I you can't do any of the cool stuff. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, you can do lots of cool things. But yeah, you can. Yeah. It's different. Like, it's completely different. It's completely different. I've been learning how to machine knit. Yeah. You know, and it is a completely right? different skill. Yeah. I will say, this is, this is machine knit. It's my first ever machine knit project. In Tarsha. Yeah. Which is okay. like... <laughs> Yeah, I do not want to do intarsia, but I will do it on a knitting right, machine. Exactly. So yeah. it's different. Yeah, it's different. Okay. Yeah. Favorite non knitting activity? Eating. Okay. Cooking. I like. I love. I like the creativity of cooking. So yeah, that's like yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Music to knit by. This is the question I was referring to earlier. Oh, anything and everything. Like I'm, I'm a knitter. I'm a, like a mu music person. I worked in the music industry for a while, in the technology. You've done everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, like on the software side. Um, and so I'm a big, but yeah, so the, the crochet I was tapping my needle and hook and toe to was um, Motown. Because it's just such a great nice. rhythm. Like I'm dancing yeah. on the streetcar and crocheting and you know what they say that if you can't find the truly eccentric person on the bus with the streetcar, that means that's you. Well, that was me that day. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. I was the wacky one. Favorite yarn show? <gasps> Could be a cheap. Could be a trick question. Whoa. Yeah, this is going to be a tough one. You know what? Um, oh. Ha. Huh. 
I have to say, you put really good yarn yeah. shows together. Yeah, okay, this is no, not, no, no, this no, is not no. for you to You know fish. why? Okay. Because your venue is always gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> you never, you're never, like, the, you know, the Yarn in the City people never you send me to a, you know, a, a Hilton conference room off the motorway service station right? Right. you know okay i'll never be in the middle of nowhere it's so they're all beautiful you. venues and because ultimately this craft is about visuals and creativity and art and beauty so to be in a really beautiful location is yeah it adds to the inspiration it really does it really yeah. does is the okay, sucking up you. obvious enough no but yeah. you do, this is something that you do that's quite distinct from a lot of other events well so. i mean finding venues is hard yeah right i mean that's the but you've got a good taste in them that's the hardest thing well we have we, we upped our budget last time <laughs> <laughs> so okay most embarrassing knitting moment embarrassing yeah. or so i have a sweater that is like the the, the gaugiest disaster of all gaugiest disasters mm -hmm. and i still wear it which is the best part so it was the very first time I tried to make a yarn substitution. I have to say I have to do this because it was it's really bad. Mm. I tried to make a yarn substitution and I did the thing that I tell people in knitting classes. You just skip over the instruction you don't understand and I didn't understand what it meant when it said gauge. So, <laughs> so I just skipped it. So this was supposed to be this kind of cute little cropped sort of fitted kind of like cowl neck pullover and it's like... 56 you inches like you around. And two of your mates in oh, it. yeah. It's still cropped, which is the only reason I can still wear it. That saved it. But it's, it is, it's like this around. It's sort of like a cropped boxy. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's bigger than boxy. It's, and it's lime yeah, green. Yeah, boxy has a lot of. Oh, yeah. Positive. Yeah, oh, well, like, yes. Yeah. There's honkers and melts of oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, and, it's, and it's in lime green mohair. So, you know, as you do. Mohair is very hot again. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Last one. This is words to live by. Best knitting advice. Wash it. Um, sheep get sheep get rained on. Don't be afraid of getting it wet. Wash your swatches. Wash your knits. Because moth prevention. Yes. Yeah. I see a lot of people who wear things that would look a thousand times better if they just had a wash to even them all out. Uh, and I see a lot of things that now I, you're knitting that, so that's a different problem. But I see a lot of yes. This is this is this that knitting being, yeah. problem with the moth was because I was knitting it, and then I got distracted, or I think yeah. I went on summer holidays, or something happened, and I shoved it in a bag, and I didn't put it in plastic yeah. the way I normally do. And, and it's different it when it's happens. a project on the needles. But I, yeah. I hear a lot of stories that well, I put my beautiful knits away for the summer. And then when I got them all out, they'd been moth-eaten. And it's simple. The way you solve that problem is you wash everything and put it in plastic. Um, so it turns out the moths feel about wool the way I feel about biscuits. Biscuits are a delivery mechanism for cheese. Wool is a delivery mechanism for the delicious stuff that moths like to eat. Uh, they're going after the oils off your skin and your hair and all of that stuff. Sweat and yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, and skin cells, as someone reminded me as well. So, and cheese too. It turns out moths also like cheese. So, if you get all of that stuff off your wool before you put it away for any length of time, then um, then the moths won't eat it. But also, frankly, it looks better if you wash it. Yeah. Yeah. And although moths, I think, are a whole other problem in yeah. London. Yeah. And, well, certainly the UK, but definitely in London. And in fact. I had them. I had. Um, I found a moth hole in a hundred percent acrylic jumper. And they're not supposed to like that. Yeah. Well, but carpet, someone suggested carpet beetles as well. I don't know how they feel about acrylic. But again, unless yeah. you're, you may be particularly delicious. Well, there could be. I don't know. Is that like a pheromone thing? Yeah. Or exactly. Something? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Something yeah, yeah. Really you good. shed. You shed something particularly delicious. Yes. Hmm. Well, go now, bombshell. On that note, <laughs> thank you so much for being my guest on Champagne and Kibbiet. Yes. And Where's the Kibbiet? Do I get a, kib a bowl of Kibbiet to take home? Is that my... Like, no. no? No, I don't really... Um, no. You're going... Millie has Kibbiet. Yeah. Where you're teaching tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh Did boy. you see it in the little presentation yeah. patch that she has? It, I, my it's almost, totally like... Yeah. Yeah. Mother's my, Day in the um, UK. Yeah, so she's got this Mother's Day kit where it's a bowl of kiviet in a leather pouch. Like, it might actually be worth giving birth for that. 
I like tagged the, I tagged my yeah. husband on Instagram yeah. on that yeah. post because yeah. I was like, uh, hello. Yeah. So, so nice. But yeah, okay, I'll take fine, I'll take the Prosecco. Okay. Well, that's a wrap on episode two of the Champagne and Kiviet vlog. Many thanks to Kate Atherley for coming and hanging out with me this afternoon and just chatting about knitting, talking about the Knitter's Dictionary, and being a really good sport about the power, uh, the Prosecco power round. Um, I also want to say a huge, huge thank you to Kate for helping to solve my, my moth-eaten project, uh, work in progress, and uh, thankfully it's only in one spot, so I'm going to be tackling that. Um, probably with a clear head, maybe not not post prosecco, but um, definitely, definitely soon getting that uh, sorted out. I have um, a lot of knitting related travel and activities coming up, so if you'd like to know more about that and make sure that you don't miss out on any episodes, please do um, subscribe and I will see you very soon. Take care. <music>